Ah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on our continued coverage of Gettysburg Day. I'm joined here by two fellow Old Glory Club members, and I'm, of course, Mr. Red Hawk. Joining me, of course, is Raging Mandrill and Paul Fahrenheit. Gentlemen, how are you doing today? Well, thank you very much. Likewise, thank you very kindly. Yeah, excellent. And of course, we were just going over on our previous stream, the reasons for the Civil War in general, but now we're going to get into the meat of the day. Indeed, of course, this is July 3rd, uh, in which Gettysburg, the battle itself occurred. So now we're going to go into a detailed description of the battle itself. So gentlemen, I think it's important for us to start at the very beginning, the actual lead up to the conflict itself. So let's go over very quickly as to how the Union and the Confederate armies ended up in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and what would become the bloodiest battle in United States history. Well, yeah, and um, uh, I think it's appropriate to, um, uh, I think it's appropriate to have the Confederates go first or the Confederate side of things go first, because that tends to be traditionally how it is depicted. Um, so looking at the situation, it's the summer of 1863. It is about June the 26th. Last year on June the 20, on June the 27th, it was last year on June the 27th, Robert E. Lee first took command of the uh, Confederate forces around the city of Richmond. They were not called the Army of Northern Virginia yet. After his uh, after the previous commander and uh, Lee's childhood and military academy friend, Joseph E. Johnston was wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines. So Lee, before this point, had only held minor commands. He was a military advisor to President Jefferson Davis. Um, and Davis, whose administration operated very much out of loyalty, loyalty to particular men, individual men, one way or another, um, basically... Davis uh, Davis knew Lee had provided him a lot of loyalty, knew Lee was very capable, and um, all that Lee had really done up until this point was, you know, lead some forces in Western Virginia early in the war and plan the uh, plan the defenses around the city of Richmond during the um, Peninsular Campaign, which was General Union General McClellan's attempt to invade Virginia through an amphibious landing. Um, so Lee was placed in command and. You know, at first, a lot of people don't understand this. He was extremely unpopular, extremely unpopular. His two nicknames when he first took command were Old Granny because of how cautious he was and his old, you know, everyone thought he was too old to lead an army. Uh, and the King of Spades because all he was, Lee was an engineer by training. And so his first instinct in warfare was to fortify, build entrenchments, do all this boring stuff instead of the um, uh, instead of these grand maneuvers that you know the Confederate Army was you know liked to do. But very quickly, Lee sort of proves himself. He um, uh, he you know gets together the um, uh, the Confederate Army, manages to repel General McClellan's assaults on Richmond, and saves Richmond from a very early fall in 1862. And it's uh, off to the races with the Second Manassas Campaign. Yes, and of course, uh, quickly following, uh, you know, the Peninsular uh, Campaign and, and Second Manassas, you, you you in quick order get the uh, Southern invasion of Maryland, and the Battle of Antietam. Um, of course, the Union side um, ha is a perfect inverse as a contrast to the Confederate side. Right from Lee onward, the Confederate forces in the East have unity of command the entire way through. They have one singular leader, whereas the Union forces are changing over leadership of who is actually the commander of the army um, every single battle, right? So after, you know, Antietam, McClellan gets relieved. After um, Chancellorsville, Hooker gets relieved. After you, you Fredericksburg. Yes, yes, I did. was in between the two. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. But so you, you after after Fredericksburg, you know, obviously Burnside gets relieved. And and yeah, so, yeah, basically you, you keep changing over leadership every single time. Um, and of course, it's a little interesting tidbit that Meade really took over command of the Union Army that would fight at Gettysburg only a couple days beforehand. It's it's interesting um, because he originally was leading. Um, he was originally a corps commander, right? And he took over uh, after leading Fifth Corps, which uh, General 
Sykes took over that court when he became the the actual army commander. Um, uh, but yes, this map that you see on the screen here is the operational map leading up to the campaign of Gettysburg. Um, so, so it's it's uh, important it's important before we get into the campaign to understand where this was coming off of. Um, the Battle of Chancellorsville immediately uh, happened immediately before this point, in the spring of 1863, um, where um, uh, where General Joe Hooker was you know, humiliated because he had, he had a force, I'd say about twice the size of Lee's and, you know, and, and Lee was able to defeat two armies, uh, that were, that very much outnumbered his. However, this came at the cost of losing one of Lee's most competent and famous corps commanders, which was general Thomas J. Jackson, uh, more famously known as Stonewall Jackson. And, um, uh, and he was in charge of third corps, if I remember correctly. Um, and this, this was a, massive, massive loss to the army of Northern Virginia. Um, and it actually prompted a complete, a complete restructuring of the entirety of the army actually Lee completely reorganized his corps, reorganized how the army fought because, um, uh, because he knew that there was no way they could kind of recapture the way they had fought with such a aggressive and generally competent corps commander like Stonewall Jackson. So he reassigned his corps to first, second, and third, um, and, um, uh, and, uh, essentially and that, was, that was from two core. He originally had two core, right? He's, he changed yeah. it to threes. That's right. Yes, correct. that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> to have, in order to have a much more mobile army that he could, now the cores were smaller, but uh, this was in order to have them uh, perform more complex maneuvers because, uh, you know, it's easier, it's easier to, um, uh, do something like that with three cores instead of two core. So in and essence, of course, and of course you can see that on the map, right? You can, you can see all of the he's got a, a triple move with three core all over the map every every single little red line that you see there's there's like three sections of them moving northward all at the same time right so you can kind of see that reflected in the actual lead up to the gettysburg campaign exactly so just like after the massive success that was the battle of second bull run being the immediate precursor to lee's first in, attempted invasion of the north adam uh, which which um uh, which resulted in the Battle of Sharpsburg, Maryland, the uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville, the massive success at Chancellorsville, um, as the culmination of a very successful winter and spring of 1862 and 1863, led to the precursor of uh, Lee's second planned invasion of the North. Now, the the political pressure for this was. Vicksburg was besieged. It had been besieged for a very long time by General Ulysses S. Grant over in Mississippi. Port Gibson, which was the other Vicksburg, was also also besieged. These two cities were the primary arteries connecting the uh, connecting Texas, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, and the uh, basically the 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 western Mississippi states, which supplied the Confederacy with a lot of foodstuffs, manufactured goods, cotton, etc. And it was really the only thing keeping the con keeping Confederate a Confederate stakehold on the Mississippi River and keeping the two halves of the Confederacy together. So Lee was. And this half is, go ahead. And, and this is lar largely in keeping with the uh, Anaconda Plan, uh, which was the Union grand strategy of the war, which is to split the South uh, along the Mississippi River and to strangle the Confederacy using a naval blockade and prevent access to supplies from from foreign nations. Exactly. And so the Confederacy still had an internal means of, uh, of connecting itself via the Mississippi, but it was very much blockaded. So Lee was tasked by the Confederate government by because uh, he, ha he had a meeting with Jefferson Davis about this plan. And Jefferson Davis essentially tasked him with um, uh, in, uh, an attempted invasion of the North uh, to draw out and either um, either destroy, ideally destroy, or grievously defeat the Army of the Potomac north of Washington, D.C., in order to cause such a political morale shock amongst the Union and the general nations of the world that um, uh, the Confederacy would achieve a couple of geopolitical objectives. Number one, they would achieve uh, support of foreign nations as they showed that they could, um, uh, they could triumph on the field of battle even despite being massively outnumbered, and this would give them legitimacy as a nation and hopefully secure Britain and France's support, which the Confederacy believed would be their key to victory. Uh, second, they hoped to uh, cause such a morale shock amongst the Union government 
that they could present that Jefferson Davis could present a letter to uh, President Abraham Lincoln simultaneous with the securing of that foreign support, essentially offering a a peace where the Confederacy would be allowed to secede and, you know, an armistice would be signed. So that's the general goals that the Confederate government is going towards. And Lee devised a plan to head north, splitting his corps one, two, and three, using the Blue Ridge Mountains to um, essentially keep keep his corps from being observed because the Confederates had more or less uncontested control over the uh, over the Great Valley ever since Stonewall Jackson's Victorious Valley campaign in 1862. And um, Lee planned to uh, to attack the uh, Union Army or draw the Union Army out somewhere in Pennsylvania. Yeah, indeed. So as we can see on the map here, we have all of our, uh, you know, cores from both sides of the fighting all, um, you know, centering around Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which just happened to be where the men ran into each other. And this uh, leads up to the actual first day of engagement here on July 1st. Uh, here we go with the map right here where, uh, you know, the Confederates and the Union uh, armies actually first clash for the first day. So, gentlemen, how would you walk us through this? What is actually occurring here on July 1st, 1863? Well, first, I'd like to make a note uh, that the Confederate cavalry was notably absent uh, for, you know, the initial phase of this battle, which is kind of a disaster uh, for the Confederates. Um, uh, Lee famously said that uh, General Stewart uh, was his his eyes and ears. Right. So he he splits off his cavalry and you can on the operational map, you could see that that was the dotted line that was moving north uh, on the uh, eastern side of the map, that was Stuart uh, moving northward, separate from the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia. So he doesn't have cavalry. He doesn't have, you know, the ability the ability that cavalry provides during this period, which is your, your scouting force. Um, so he's kind of he's splitting up his corps in enemy territory, and he's moving around in in enemy territory semi blind. Um, so not just not just semi blind, he's he's more or less outright blind. Um, you know, he, he had his the, the plan was to have um, a Jubal Early's uh, Jubal Early's not Jubal Early. Um, the plan was to have um, General Ewell's Corps, um, General Ewell's Corps take the uh, the northern part, uh, have um, uh, have Longstreet's first corps bringing up the rear and the uh, and the and the third corps, of course, moving in support of both of them. Uh, um, however, uh, what was it? However, without Stuart, cause Stuart, the plan crossing over the Potomac river, uh, Stuart found guarded by a significant force and Stuart's cavalry was fresh off a, uh, was fresh off the largest cavalry battle of the war, uh, Brandy station, which left him without a lot of able men. And so he couldn't fight that battle. And so he attempted to move further South across the Potomac. And this led to a sort of whole zany, wacky Stuart tries to find his way out of Union territory, all the all while Lee's three corps are split up, very easily encirclable and um uh, and and destroyable because they are not combined as an army. And um if they if any of them bump into the Union Army, it's very likely that that Union Army could just destroy that core. Um which is and so in many ways it's very if you look at the the situation that existed, it's it's very fortunate that um uh, that on June the 30th, uh, Major, Major General, what was it, Brigadier General of Union Cavalry, John Buford, made the decision that he did. Yes, this is correct. Uh, he, of course, um, was on the first day um, on his lonesome, essentially, and he gets attacked by the Confederate forces, um, and he has to, a decision to make. So uh, the Union plan generally speaking, um, considering that they just changed over a corps commander, is to obviously fight the Confederate army where and to locate and destroy them and basically to not lose, right? You don't want your forces getting destroyed or significantly defeated. Meade, as a general, is a much more cautious commander and seems because he's such a new commander, he's much less susceptible to the political pressure that some of the other Union generals seem to feel. Um, so he's much less um, he's much less susceptible to being pressured into attacking a bad position um, 
unlike some of the other union generals. Uh, so he's much more cautious, um, which is from the union's perspective, exactly what he needed to be. Yeah. And so, in essence, you know, Gen General George Meade, actually, he, um, he was personally familiar with General Lee, you know, they were both engineers by training. Um, they were actually both on General Winfield Scott's topographical engineer uh, unit during the um, uh, during the uh, Mexican War, when General Winfield Scott did his sort of uh, reverse, not revert, but like he, he redid Cortez's uh, landing at Veracruz and then marching up to Mexico City. And they were both uh, very famous men. Uh, other people in that unit that one might be familiar with was uh, PGT Beauregard and, and George McClellan himself. Um, but yes, uh, that, that was very much Meade's strategy. Meade being a very cautious commander, um, uh, was, was in essence looking to, looking to locate Lee and then attempt to bring to bear as many numbers as possible. He was very eager not to make the mistakes. Someone like, like the sort of vain, vain, glorious, aggressively foolish attackers, like, a like John Pope who lost at second Manassas or like Joe Hooker who lost at uh, Chancellorsville would do, um, but uh, Brigadier General John Buford, who's the commander of the Union Cavalry, he was this sort of cowboy type, um, Western cavalryman, knew how to fought Indian style, trained his trained his soldiers to fight Indian style, very different from a, from a Jeb Stuart, who was a lot closer to this sort of Napoleonic Marshal Murat figure who did this dazzling, did these dazzling uh, cavalry charges. Um Deploys his uh, deploys his cavalrymen because um, earlier that day there were some Confederate pickets who were um, uh, who were scouting out Gettysburg because what was going on in the Confederate camp was General uh, one of General Richard Ewell's subordinates uh, General Harry Heath um, knew at the town of Gettysburg there was a shoe factory and so he requested General Heath requested from General Ewell uh, to uh, you know go relieve the town of their shoes in order to uh, in order to dress up his men because most of the confederate army not only did they have very poor uniforms uh you know very ratty ragged dirty soldiers but most of them a lot of i don't know about most of them but a lot of them just did not have shoes um and so um by securing shoes he hoped to um he hoped to make the rigors of a campaign in foreign territory a lot easier and so on the day of july the first um General Buford deploys his uh, cavalry dragoon style in a layered series of defense in order to fight a holding action against uh, General Harry Heath's brigade. General Harry Heath, first, and you know, despite having orders, Lee gave orders to all of his generals: do not engage, do not engage, do not engage. Wait till the army concentrates. Um, Harry Heath uh, was not because he was you know blind; he didn't have cavalry. He was um uh, was it, he believed that he was going up against a you know a sort of Union Home Guard unit, which was these local militias that would concentrate around these towns, especially when when um uh, when Confederate forces were reported in the area. And these were not professional soldiers; these were old men and young boys with not very complex military weapons. And General Heath believed that they wouldn't stand very long against a professional, disciplined, battle-hardened uh, brigade of infantry. However. Um, he encounters General Buford, who, you know, even though he's outnumbered about three to one, General Buford has about 3,000, General Heath has about 10,000. Um, Buford's cavalrymen are armed with repeating rifles and are arrayed in a very well structured defensive position with some horse artillery. And they're able to beat back the first couple of attacks of Harry Heath. And so Harry Heath decides to commit his whole brigade. For you know, which which um, uh, which then immediately commences the battle, and um, General Yule hears about it and um, uh, and believes that believes that um, uh, the battle has started, and so he begins concentrating his corps around the town of Gettysburg. It's about this time that Lee rides up and he's appraised of the situation. Yeah, and of course you can you un, you've heard the the famous names right. You've got McPherson's Ridge, which is where Reynolds and and Doubleday. Um, they bring up their core in response once they figure out that Buell is getting attacked and, and they need to get up uh, and help him. Um, so, you know, you have these, the Union reinforcements just start pouring in throughout the course of the day. It's, it's somewhat piecemeal. Everybody's getting, nobody really wants to fight this battle uh, at this point. Um, you know, the Union forces just kind of under Reynolds just realize, oh, crap, the Confederates are all here. Let's just fight them here. Uh, why not? And, um, 
and so famously Reynolds brings up his core and and re helps to relieve Buford, um, um, who's obviously very grievously outnumbered. Yeah, and so General General Reynolds was one of the most respected men of either side of the army. He was one of the few professional, competent officers that the Army of the Potomac had. However, he was prevented from ascending to command mostly due to the political restrictions. Um, Reynolds was offered command of the Army of the Potomac um, a few days prior to prior to Meade receiving the offer, and Reynolds basically said, "I will accept it." Um, I will accept it given you give me freedom of maneuver. You give me the freedom essentially to act with carte blanche without any sort of control from the um, uh, federal government from Washington, D.C. And this was obviously refused. And so he refused the command. A lot of people don't understand this about the Army of the Potomac, but it was almost entirely sort of dictated from Washington, D.C. by um, uh, by General Halleck, who was kind of the commander in chief of of the military under under Lincoln and um, Lincoln himself. This is the reason why, you know, if, if a general lost a battle um, or lost too many battles, then he was sacked, fired, and another one was appointed in his place. And so this didn't really exactly breed competency within the general, the general staff and really the entire officer corps of the Army of the Potomac because political sort of loyalty and you know, being the guy who was willing to play ball with the central government who wasn't there on the field led to this sort of command, um, this this style of command. But yes, General Reynolds brings up his corps, uh, comes into contact with them, uh, with pretty much all of all of Ewell's corps. Um, and Lee is, you know, Lee is informed of the situation and he is mad. He is mad. His orders not to engage were directly disobeyed. Um, he does not know where Stewart is. He doesn't know what's going on. Um, he he's you know his deepest fears. He's afraid that the um, that the entire Union Army is about to smash his three corps piecemeal. However, he gets word that uh, he gets word that Early's Early's um, Early's brigade and or Early's division rather um, under uh, under. Ewell's Corps is marching down from Carlisle, completely unopposed. He also gets word that um, uh, he also gets word that his other corps under AP Hill are marching up from the south, uh, from um, I think from uh, what was it from Frederick, uh, Maryland, um, and basically they're all kind of converging just almost by complete happenstance at one. And Lee ascertains correctly he's only up against really two core, and he's about to get three core um, that are all converging at very tactically inconvenient areas for the Union commander. Add to this the fact that during um, uh, during uh, during the first day during the fighting that occurred when General John Reynolds brings his core up, he was killed during a uh, during a charge, which means that the ranking officer on the field uh, was was dead, and there was very much confusion among the high command. This caused a rout. Um, Combined with because this happened right at about the same time that uh, Jubal Early and AP Hill arrived, which you know, which kind of was too much for the Union Army to handle, and so they break. They all break. Um, they retreat through the town of Gettysburg. Um, one very famous anecdote is that uh, General Schimmelfenig, who was a um, um, who was a I think a Prussian officer prior to uh, prior to immigrating to the United States and becoming an officer in the um, uh, in the Union Army, he was a he was in command of one of the German divisions. Um, he kind of he was separated from his men in the retreat, and he hid in a farmhouse for the entire three days of the battle because he was behind Confederate lines. Um, that's that's a funny story. Um, speaking of of generals getting getting shot, um, so it, there's a famous uh, story about uh, General Harry Heath, um, who obviously was pretty heavily involved in the first day um and he happens to get shot in the head but somehow doesn't get outright killed and the story goes is he had a like a bunch of paper that he had because obviously the day of um july 1st was an extremely hot and muggy day uh so he had some paper that he had stuffed into his hat band uh which kind of acted like a sweat band and apparently this uh, saved his life and ensured that he didn't get killed by a mini ball. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and he has that, he has a, he has a head wound throughout the day. Um, but, uh, at the, at the, what is it, Adam, um, the end of no, about halfway through the day of July 1st, General Lee kind of accepts the situation, actually sees it as a, a tactical windfall given his very poor strategic position. And um, General Longstreet has ridden up his his Longstreet's corps. I think Longstreet's first corps was lagging behind. They were not they had not been able to join the battle on the first day because they were last in the order of March. But Longstreet himself was up. And um, uh, he was also initially very supportive because of the tactical success that they had achieved. And um, Lee decided at this point to commit his full army to the battle and um, cause this, given this mass route. And by the end of the day, he had control of Gettysburg. It's at this point that General Longstreet advises Lee to pull back the army back to where they initially intended to fight a battle, which was at Cashtown, a couple of a couple of miles to the to the west, which was a far more favorable position for where Lee's army was coming. And um, uh, Longstreet used the logic that now that Meade had been defeated, he would get orders, he would get pushed very hard from Washington, D.C. to pursue Lee's army further into the Great Valley of Pennsylvania. And um, Lee could essentially uh, Lee could essentially fight Meade's army on ground of his choosing. Lee disagrees. Lee does not decide to go with this course of action because um, uh, because he believes that he does. I, I don't whether he disagreed with Longstreet's logic or whatever. He believed that the battle was to be fought there at Gettysburg and that um, uh, and that Meade was in a very precarious position. He wasn't he wouldn't be able to bring up his army in time to reinforce them in time. And that if he could just push them off that ridge, he could achieve his victory that uh, that Richmond was pushing him to get. Um, go ahead. Unfortunately, this is a, the first mistake, right? Um, the Lee, obviously, in terms of the order of battle, is pretty significantly outnumbered. Um, you know, the armies of uh, the Potomac and, and Northern Virginia, uh, the, the Army of the Potomac has far more men uh, in total. And yes, okay, you have a tactical success on the first day, um, but you weren't able to finish off the core under Howard and under Reynolds, um, on the first day, right? You just simply push them off and they retreat through Gettysburg and, and go to what's commonly known as the fish hook, right? Um, and of course we'll get into that position yeah, in a moment. Yeah. But that's, yeah. If you general are ready, we can almost transfer into the um, uh, second day here. If you yes. uh, are ready. Yeah, but I so, agree with, I agree with the strategic analysis um, that what Lee should have done was what Longstreet recommended. Longstreet had the better call on this. Um, in every single case uh, in this war up to this point, the, the union forces, their, their army commander always got pressured by um by halleck by washington to go on the attack when it wasn't actually tactically um beneficial uh when it wasn't a good situation and every single time it always ends in a union defeat and this is pretty much what the confederates should have done um if they had achieved some sort of disastrous defeat against the union forces even if it's even if it's tactically a defensive uh, scenario, that's still going to be a victory. So, you know, from Lee's perspective, what you want is to win, right? And you, you don't want to, to lose. And you certainly don't want to fight a, a battle where you take basically the same amount of casualties as the enemy. But anyway. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, well, I'll go ahead, Paul, and then I'll... Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so transitioning kind of into bringing about July the 2nd, the night of July the 1st, um, after the, the battle is sort of subsided, um, Lee, what is it? Lee, Lee, during the day, Lee ordered General A.P. Hill, who was the replacement for sort of Stonewall Jackson's role. He was one of Stonewall Jackson's most aggressive commanders. Um, Lee ordered A.P. Hill during the first day to take the high ground south of Gettysburg that the locals called a little round top, if practicable. Those were the two words that Lee, this was one of the second mistakes. All right. Lee, mm, yes. Lee, Lee gave too much leeway with this command. AP Hill was new to Corps command. He, he had really, he had the biggest shoes to fill in the army of Northern Virginia being Stonewall Jackson's. And he decided being a cautious new commander like Meade was that it was not practicable. Now this was during the day, during the evening, 
General Isaac Trimble, who was not under any um, uh, major command uh, at this point, he was kind of a, he was kind of an attache to Lee's headquarters. Lee kind of detached him to go sort of observe Hill's command. General Trimble basically said to AP and uh, to AP Hill and General Ewell, who were watching sort of the lines get set that evening, he said, you know, he, he very famously said, give me one division, I will take that hill. Give me one brigade, I will take that hill. Give me one regiment, and I will take that hill. And they all kind of ignored him. And um, and he, you know, he kind of complained. He, he basically went to Lee and he complained. He's like, we should have taken the high ground, and now we're going to have to take it the next day. And, you know, and even then, even by the early morning, the, the high ground wasn't occupied the morning of July the 2nd. Um, but Longstreet's Corps comes up. Uh, on in the night of July the 1st, they get a raid. Lee starts planning his battle plan. And his his big plan is to do a massive push on the Union right flank with Longstreet's fresh troops who are not engaged, supported by AP Hill, um, while I'm uh, doing a distractive attack on the uh, on the Union left flank. All right. Yes. Right. And this so what so basically what we have here, uh the first day the uh, fighting commences almost by accident. The two armies basically get drawn into Gettysburg, which is an extremely small town at this time. It's only a couple thousand people. It's about a farming town, essentially, no fortifications of any kind in it. So it didn't really make sense for the Confederates to, you know, hold up in the town after they had taken it after the first day. And basically yeah. the stage is now set now for the second day. The Union line, they form of what is known as the Fishhook, um, as we're all familiar with, on the high ground in the hills and the forest forests outside of uh, Gettysburg and of course they're overlooking a mile long stretch between um you know uh long streets uh troops which is just an open farm field um so they have their artillery on the hills there's uh thick forests um, on top of those hills as well and the union uh line which or the union troops which are around 90,000 strong at this point are just going to hold up and basically wait for the confederates to attack with their 70,000 troops and this is basically where what's going on into the second day of the battle here so take it away, Jens. Yeah, and I, I would just uh, go back to the situation on Culp's Hill uh, at the northeastern end of the Fishhook. It, it, it was so incredibly disastrous for the Confederates to not have Stonewall Jackson at this point because you can – and everybody that everybody who is a Civil War scholar who studies the Civil War history knows that Thomas Jackson as a general would have absolutely been – aggressive enough and and intelligent enough to to take a advantageous position after you had already swept the field of enemy forces on the first day of the battle um so that that's just i guess the vagaries of fate really yeah indeed uh what yeah, might have true. been um <laughs> But I'm um, uh, but basically so 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 what's what's going on on the morning of July the second? All right, Lee has arrayed his troops for attack. Lee has arrayed his troops for attack on um uh, on the hill on Little Round Top, um and um uh, and pretty much throughout the entirety of the Union right flank. Longstreet has his fresh corps up, um notably with uh notably absent Pickett's division, which was the final division on the um uh, on the march of the Army of the of, of Northern Virginia, um. And um, and Lee orders Longstreet to attack. Now, Longstreet they have, they have an initial meeting at the beginning of the day. Uh, Longstreet once again attempts to advise to Lee, "Hey, you know they're they're really fortified on that hill. I don't think we can take it. I highly advise we we pull back." Lee is 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 adamant. He wants to attack. He wants to um, he wants to drive them off the high grounds and all of that. Um, and so. So, um, uh, so, so, well, people right at the start here hearing this would kind of think that's kind of uh, foolhardy to go and attack, but we have to remember that Little Round Top is the Union line on the south side. So, if you take this, you can uh, overrun those hills and cave in the entire Union flank. And at that point, when you have them surrounded, uh, it's much easier to fire upon them. And that's essentially, you know, the victory for that Lee wants right there. You could fire upon them from the higher hilltop positions, um, and there you go, right? Correct. And and the, the plan for day two is essentially a pincer movement, right? You have the attack on Culp's Hill uh, and the attack on Little Round Top. Um, and so if you can, 
if you imagine none of the stuff in the middle of the map, which is all pickets charged, that's all day three stuff. Um, but the two, the top of the map and the bottom of the map are basically all the attack arrows going. So um, it's just essentially kind of a pincer move uh, and, and taking these two hilly positions on every single uh, on the uh, the ends of the uh, Union Army. And if you could take those, obviously you win. And so if the Confederates had a, a chance at victory, it was it was being able to take those tactical positions. Yes, and um, and Longstreet, Longstreet, who was ordered to um, uh, to attack that hill, chooses General John Bell Hood as the uh, as the spear point of that. Now, General Hood, he had been promoted. Uh, I think he had been promoted from, I think he had been promoted from brigade commander to uh, division commander. Um, Hood was very famously the brigade commander of Hood's Texas Brigade back when um, uh, back when Longstreet was a division commander. And um, uh, and his sort of finest hour was both at the – he had two really notable moments. The Battle of Gaines Mill, he, he led a very, very aggressive assault that, um, that, um, uh, that very much shaped the, shaped the outcome of the battle. And then at the Battle of Sharpsburg, at the Battle of Dunker Church, the Texas Brigade held at Dunker Church. I think they began the day with something about 800 men, and they ended the day with something about 200 men. Um, and um, and and in essence, the Texas Brigade was Lee's shock troops. They were the they were the most aggressive unit. They were the most like well known unit um, of the Army of Northern Virginia. And their commander was John Bell Hood, who was probably the most aggressive commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. He was an attack dog. He was a raging cowboy from Texas, and uh, he he was kind of the perfect the perfect commander for the perfect unit. And so when he got promoted up to division level command underneath uh, Longstreet's Corps, he kind of kept that aggressiveness, which is why his division, including the Texas Brigade, was chosen for the attack. Um, but even Hood, who was a really aggressive attacker, looking out on the on the hill, um, you know, talking about, I'm talking about, talking with Longstreet about how the attack would go, Hood insisted that it was not a good idea to assault up through that hill. He, he insisted that they go around the right, that they attempt to, to outflank the Union line. And Longstreet kind of shook his head and basically said, look, this is the battle plan. Um, I need you to go up and take that hill. And Hood, very famously, he attacked under a protest. He, he, he did not believe it was the right tactical decision, but he, uh, he, he, did, he obeyed orders and he led his division into an attack. Yeah, and so you can see that this decision entirely is Lee's decision. It's no one else's. Longstreet has told Lee by this point, sir, I don't think this is a good idea. The people under Longstreet have said, I don't think this is a good idea, but we're going to do it anyway. It's true. And so, you know, I'm uh, what, so, Mandra, what's, what's going on with the Union line at this time? Okay, so... Obviously, the Union forces um, are now assembled after the first day. Um, they're reeling after the death of General Reynolds, uh, but you know Meade is now on the field. Um, the positions are taken in the fishhook, and but there's a bit of a problem, right? Um, you can see in the there's a little strange bulge in the center of the Union line there, which is uh, that's going to be Sickles, um, which Sickles in the Peach Orchard gets himself a little farther ahead than he should be, and and almost causes trouble for the Union lines because if the Confederates had decided to attack there, well then you you can achieve by the destruction of of Sickles units a breach in the center of the union line and therefore the union now has to has to make a battle plan that doesn't around involve holding the two ends of the line now i have to defend my center so this is basically the the big test for the union of the day is is i i hold the positions on both culp's hill and a little round top and whatever action is going on in the center i just make sure that it doesn't end in disaster there so that's literally what's happening there you know, Sickles, no one knew why Sickles advanced his core so far forward. Um, 
And but you know, but it, it very much was saved by uh, that's why the battle at the Peach Orchard happened because Sickles' soldiers were just that far forward. Um, and he, he pulled them back in a fighting retreat. Sickles was um uh, was wounded and during the battle, and he was actually hmm. unfit for command after the war. Um, yes, he um yeah. he was um he lost a, a leg if I remember correctly. Yeah, his right leg to a cannonball. Yeah, yeah, he lost his right leg, but that did not stop him from after the war. Uh, fucking the Queen of Spain. So, you know, that's a real story that did happen. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Wow. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, she was the deposed Queen of Spain, though. Um, but she was a very, very infamous nymphomaniac, and uh, Sickles had a rendezvous with her. Um, but you know, that's 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 Sickles. Um, that's 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 there goes Dan Sickles from the war. Um, meanwhile, Hood Hood's attack uphill is not going very well. Uh, mostly because he is meeting up against the resistance of um uh, of some of the some of what was it it was a uh, what was what was his name um uh, Winfield Scott Hancock that's who it was Winfield Scott Hancock who I believe was in command of Fourth Corps um, I could be I could be wrong um, Hancock was in command of Second Corps but go on Second Corps yeah so so um uh, I think he was um. Once again, I could have this wrong, but I believe he uh, ascended to core command after after Meade was promoted. Um, uh, and... You would be incorrect. That would be George Sykes, who commanded okay, yeah, Fifth so, Corps. But regardless, okay, so Sykes Fifth Corps is up um uh, is up on the hill. Then uh, yeah, it's right there. I, I should have looked at the freaking map, you know. But um, but regardless, Sykes's Fifth Corps is um uh, is is battle hardened. They've fought everywhere since Fredericksburg. Um, and among them is a very famous unit called the 20th Maine. Now, the 20th Maine is is commanded by um uh, by Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He had recently been promoted to colonel. Uh, he was a professor from Maine at Bowdoin College, um, professor of classics and this like. And and you know he had a an idea of you know getting a taste for warfare. And then he fought at the Battle of Fredericksburg and listened to the screaming of agony of wounded and dying men on the slopes for a, in the freezing bitter cold for basically an entire evening. Um, and that was his first taste of war, but you know, he's, he's ordered to hold the extreme, the extreme left of the union line, um, at which, uh, which hoods unit is, is trying to sort of, uh, once it's, it's like, once you, uh, it's all about leverage, right? If hoods, if hoods attack uphill can break the extreme left of the union line, they can then kind of sweep down using the momentum of the hill kind of like a um, uh, kind of like rolling a boulder down the hill to sort of sweep them off of this high ground and make it so he attacks uphill once the first time and general hood is wounded on his um, uh, on his attack up the hill he's blown off his horse he's taken to the rear um his uh, his soldiers don't know if he's living or dead but they decide to keep attacking anyway and they're repulsed the first time they attack up Little Round Top, and they're repulsed the second time. Um, and they're like both sides, both the, the Union holding the um, holding the top of Little Round Top and um, uh, and Hood's division attacking up Little Round Top are just taking absolutely grievous casualties. The um, um the Union the, the Confederate soldiers they're climbing up very rocky outcroppings, very thick forest. I've been to Little Round Top, and it is I'm telling you, I look like I would have a hard I would get out of breath climbing it without you know bullets flying my way. And, and I too. too. Yeah, I too indeed. have been to Little Round Top, and it is it is an extremely imposing position for sure. Yeah, the uh, the United States has done a fantastic job of maintaining the battlefield to be extremely similar to what it actually was uh, during that day. Very very thick forest. You're moving up a steep incline. You can't just charge right up it as quickly as possible. So as the Confederates are slowly making their way up the hill, they are suffering from heavy fire from uh, Chamberlain's main uh, division. So. And, yes, very difficult fighting indeed. And to give credit where credit is due, the Union forces in in uh, defending this area are are not without loss themselves. They um, they took quite a few casualties in in return. Um, I th think there was a, a brigadier general named O'Rourke, if I remember correctly, who's an Irishman who got killed in in Little Round Top. Uh, so it's not like the Union forces are not taking any any damage in return. 
Right. So yeah. it's very much back and forth uh, fighting here. And then, of course, um, well, we'll be talking about this on the stream afterwards today, but the famous scene from uh, the Gettysburg movie and as well from the battle itself here where, you know, Chamberlain's men are out of ammunition and basically they have nowhere to go. They can't retreat because then the Confederates can just run over the, you know, the hill and cave in the uh, Union flank. So they have to fight. And why don't you gentlemen walk us through what they decide to do? Yeah, so 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 Chamberlain, you know, what is it? The Hood Hood's Hood's division regroups, attacks uphill for the third time. Chamberlain, of course, he's he's out of ammunition. He's lost enough soldiers that if the Confederates uh, manage to close the distance, they're not going to be able to have the concentration of fire to break up the attack. And it's very likely that his it's very likely that he his position will be overrun because he just simply does not have the bodies to hold it. And so Chamberlain makes a split second decision. This is this is something that was done during Napoleonic warfare called a counter charge, right? If there's one thing a charging enemy does not expect, they do not expect the enemy they are charging to get up and charge them, right? So um, Chamberlain Chamberlain sort of um, uh, analyzes the tactical dis- tactical situation, decides to have his his soldiers uh, fix bayonets and perform a counter charge using the momentum of the hill. And this is very effective because it it you know catches Hood's exhausted troops completely off guard, causes a rout. They retreat down the hill, and um. um and they regroup, and that's kind of that's kind of the sort of ending point of the attack that day. Um, not the uh, not the less of which I'm a to, not just to emphasize what was going on at Little Round Top. General Early and you know General Johnson were both um were both heavily engaged at Culp's Hill to similar results that um uh, that Hood had attempting to attack another fortified uphill position. It, it didn't go. They didn't take the grievous casualties. Hood's division did. Um, and Hood would Hood would survive the battle, but he would become permanently crippled afterwards. Yeah. So essentially, what happens rounding up the second day here is the Confederates try their best to you know do this pincer move on these two hills on the north end and the south end of the Union lines, uh, both of which are unsuccessful in routing the Union soldiers. Um, the Confederates did uh, manage to push back um, Sickles' unit at the Peach uh, at the Peach Orchard. But it really doesn't have much effect in the battle uh, as a whole. So now we're leading into the third day of the fighting here. And this is going to be the bloodiest day of the battle. And up until this point, the bloodiest battle in American history. So why don't you gentlemen walk us through the third day of the fighting. On July 3rd, 1863, um, you know, 160 years ago to the day. So Yes. Um, Go ahead, so Paul. Miss Miss Mandrel. So for, what what happens first is that um a Stewart on the night of July second makes his way back to um uh, makes his way to Gettysburg. He he had this whole zany, wacky, wild ride attempting to avoid these massive Union Corps, which unbeknownst to him were actually moving up to reinforce the battle that was ongoing at Gettysburg. Once he found out that there was a battle going on, he avoided the uh, federal cavalry that was kind of stalking him, trying to catch him out, and it manages to reunite with Lee's army on the night of July the second. In addition, General Pickett's division uh, finally makes it up to the battlefield on the night of July the second. It is the one division that has not yet been committed, um, and um, and uh, Lee Lee sort of um, was it Lee? They get they, they get positioned in the field of battle, and um, you know. And, and so so the Confederate forces are very much bloodied. Um, they've kind of lost a very good chunk of their army that day for no real reason, uh, well, for no real result, rather. Not for no real reason, but for no real result. Um, and um, and that's what's going on at the Confederate lines. The, um, uh, the Confederate army is finally whole again. Stuart is back, but it's kind of too little, too late. Mr. Mandrell, what's going on with the, with the Union army uh, the night of July the 2nd? Okay, so um, this, the same as always, um, they are holding in this fishhook position. Uh, Sickles Corps gets pretty badly beat up, of course, uh, on the second day, and uh, all the units on Little Round Top are also beat up. Um, the one area that the Union is kind of debating is, well, okay, we got Lee kind of where we want him. Uh, he's been attacking us to no effect. What do, what do we do now? And so the big debate on the Union command side is, well, do we attack the Confederate forces or do we predict that the Confederates are going to attack? And so the Union 
all basically they have um, a uh, a council of war essentially with all the Union High Commanders at General Meade's headquarters, and they make the decision we're not going to attack. Right, we're we're going to wait Lee and see what he does. And of course, this is Meade being a cautious new army commander, um, and he you know he just thinks, okay, well, we have a good position. Why would I leave it, right? Why would I let Lee, you know, you, you've already achieved what is essentially a tactical draw. So why be aggressive when there's absolutely no tactical reason or, or operational reason to go on the offensive? So the yeah. Unioners just decide to hold. They're going to stay put on the, th the third day. In addition, this was reinforced by the fact that um, uh, Meade was was reinforced with the remaining core of his army, who he was able to kind of place in a strategic reserve and start um, uh, start reinforcing his unit. So Meade's whole army was here, so he was very much incentivized to um, uh, very much incentivized to hold that position. Um, but the morning of July third comes, and um, Lee arranges his um, uh, arranges the the fresher divisions. And informs his generals that he is planning an all-out attack in the center um, of of um, uh, of General uh, of, of, of of Meade's army, and Longstreet just thinks this is absolutely insane. Longstreet is basically pleading with Lee, begging Lee at this point, please pull back. We're not going to push them off that hill. They were very likely reinforced overnight. We do not have the men to be spending here. Um, we might as well just pull everyone back, you know, coalesce, either either fight them elsewhere or just pull back into Virginia because otherwise, you know, Longstreet believed that the army was going to be destroyed. Lee disagrees with him like he disagreed with him the previous day. This is very, very out of character for Lee. Everyone, you know, Gettysburg, of all, now the Civil War is probably the most Monday morning quarterback war in American history, all right? Um, <laughs> That's for sure. But Gettysburg is the most Monday morning quarterbacked part of the most Monday morning quarterbacked war in history. And it's mostly just because Lee, no one knows what Lee was thinking, how he was thinking it or why he was thinking it. You know, they don't they don't understand why he didn't pull back on day one. They don't understand why he kept attacking a very obviously defended position on day two. And they don't understand why he did what he was about to do on days three. Um so ex Go ahead. explain to us, Paul, what possible reason could Lee have had uh, to make this, this what obviously to us seems like a suicidal attack on the third day. What tactical reasoning does he have to make this attack in the first place? So a lot of people, at least this is how people ascertain it, Lee probably believed that, um, um, that Meade had not been reinforced as quickly as his subordinates were saying they believed Meade was very much weakened, bloodied. Um, he believed because of the fighting on the first day, because of, um, uh, you know, because of how much he had bled them on the second day on the left and the right. Uh, Lee believed that because he had weak them on the left and the right, Meade had reinforced the left and the right expecting continuous attacks and that Meade had not reinforced the center. He had weakened the center actually in order to um, reinforce the left and the right, um, which is why Lee was arranging the um, uh, the less damaged divisions, including Pickett's uncommitted division, which, by the way, Pick Pickett's division had not experienced combat prior to this. It was, but, you know, General Pickett himself had, but not his, not his division under him. They were a green division from Virginia. And, um, um, and so Lee had, had this idea that he would perform this sort of, massive Napoleonic assault at the center of the Union line um, immediately following a massive artillery barrage. Um, at that point, it was the largest artillery barrage in the Western Hemisphere at that time it, in history. It, it still it still is. There hasn't been a larger one since. There hasn't been enough guns arrayed in that in that manner to um, uh, to perform another artillery barrage like that. I mean, not counting stuff like nukes and all of that. But um, um but yeah, so um, so Lee, in essence, orders um, uh, orders Colonel uh, Edward Porter Alexander, who's this sort of artillery genius of the of the Army of Northern Virginia, to array his most of his guns and to expend almost all of his ammunition, um, softening up the Union center. He then orders General um, uh, General um, 
Johnson Pettigrew, General George Pickett, and General Isaac Trimble, um, as well as General Anderson and General McClaws uh, to um, uh, array at the center on Seminary Ridge, where Lee's headquarter has been, in order to do a massive attack in the center. All right. Now, Longstreet just, just he, he begs with Lee. He tells Lee, um, look, we, we should not do this. I, we, I don't know. You know they're, they're, they've probably reinforced overnight the artillery. We don't have the concentration of firepower. We don't have the ammunition. Um, even if we do push them off that ridge, um, you know, they're just going to reinforce and push us back and they're not going to have this mass route. But once again, Lee is adamant. He decides that this is what we are going to do. And I think and it was Longstreet who was quoted very famously of saying, I don't think any 10,000 men ever arrayed for battle could take that ridge. And I will say, theoretically, this, this attack on the center is possible um from a napoleonic standpoint if you have the kind of guns if you have them and the difference that i see here is the manpower right the differential in manpower if you know napoleon really would never try something like this if he was outmanned um every every single frontal attack you ever see him make it in in places like um especially at vagram he always outnumbers his enemy pretty substantially. So there's always a reserve that you have once you you can make an initial penetration uh, in the enemy center of the line. Um, naturally, on the Union side, you have General Hancock, who's a charismatic figure in and of himself. Uh, famously, during Pickett's charge, he stated, you know, when his troops told him, you need to get down, sir, please get down. He says, sometimes the life of a corps commander does not count, right? And so... Um, and of, of course, there's. Uh, I mean, we'll get into that for for the movie stream. I, I should I should I should keep that for the movie stream. But uh, well, yes, the these... union forces the union forces hold and and manage to just stay put during this bombardment and and receive the charge of Pickett's division. Well, you know, a lot of these a lot of these moments that the movie sort of captures were actual tactical moments, like like apocryphal or otherwise documented moments that did in fact happen. Um, and, you know, the Civil the civil War is the most dramatic war, I think, that's ever been fought. You know, if you ever read the dispatches that these generals wrote to each other, you know, it, it reads it reads like it's like a like a Shakespearean play or something like that. Like, there was just so much like pathos, you know, if you're just reading. And these are official military dispatches. It's like my um, uh, my most, you know, my most noble and dear general. Um, those treacherous Yankees have advanced upon us in this position. I beg your permission to um uh, to dispatch them as quickly as possible that we may whatever the south or whatever signed your most humble and obedient servant or whatever and it's like and it's like this is these are official military dispatches you know uh these aren't like these aren't like love letters or anything like that but um but yes um lee concentrates his artillery begins this massive artillery bombardment of the union center of hancock's corps um and um accidentally invents the uh the box barrage which would then be used in world war one which is the arraying of every piece of artillery available to target one single grid square and then sending a uh, infantry element to break through that massively weakened sort of grid square um the problem was is that porter alexander's artillery while accurate was overshooting the front lines they were absolutely wreaking havoc on the wounded, bloodied units that had fought the day before, and um, and the field hospitals and the supply lines and all that, but the fresh new units that were that were um, holding the front of the line were weren't really being touched. Um, it is then, you know, it is then, you know, the artillery barrage is to be kept going as long as possible, and you know, Long Longstreet, who's the larger part of his corps has been committed to this, a large part of AP Hill's corps as well. Um, you know, Porter Alexander basically tells Longstreet, when are you going to give this order? Because we're going to run out of ammunition to support the attack if you don't give it soon. And Longstreet can't bring himself to give the order. Uh, Pickett, Pickett asks him and Pickett, Pickett and Longstreet were best friends prior to the war. They were both in the same regiment of artillery, not artillery, infantry during the Mexican-American War. And it was very famously George Pickett. It was, it was second lieutenant George Pickett and first lieutenant um in first lieutenant james longstreet who were at the battle of chapultepec castle 
and Longstreet leads the charge with waving the colors to storm the walls of Chapultepec Castle, which was the final battle to take the fortress overlooking Mexico City. And he was wounded during the attack. And so George Pickett, who was Longstreet's best friend, picks up the uh, colors and was the first American over the walls at Chapultepec Castle. But Pickett is asking Longstreet, um, you know, is asking Longstreet for permission to charge. Longstreet can't give the order. So Pickett just kind of gives the order himself. And this begins a very, very long march over about a mile of completely, completely open farmland. This is, um, this is, there's no cover other than like a little farm in the middle of it, which really only served to concentrate fire rather than, um, uh, rather than provide cover to the men that were marching across it. And, um, it was also an extremely hot day. So yeah. the, uh, Confederates couldn't just run right across it as quickly as possible. They were dehydrated, they were tired and they're, you know, being bombarded by artillery and gunfire. And of course, the famous picket charge uh, results in sixty percent casualties uh, for the Confederates. Yeah, they um, yeah. they close they close the distance over the field, and you know they're just they're just getting absolutely obliterated by first by long range artillery fire, then as they get closer, uh, grape shot, um, which is if you if the audience doesn't know what grape shot is, it's this basically this big shotgun pelt, the shotgun shell that's loaded into cannons. And it's full of mini balls, so it's essentially a cannon-sized shotgun shell, which is absolutely devastating against massed infantry. Well, um, actually, go actually, ahead. yes. Uh, so there's a, there's a slight distinction between grape shot and and canister. Canister is the one where you have all the tiny little like pellets and 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 mini like musket balls or whatever, and then you have grape shot, which are several like you know they're they're like a little, slightly bigger, right? They're they're usually in in cannons. There's only like you know a couple of them but it's the same effect right um and at this time we have to remember for the artillery you still have you know um solid shot and you also have um you also have sh like shot that does actually explode um uh like shrapnel shells and things like that so as they're advancing you're having shrapnel popping off over your head you're having in incoming solid rounds striking the round to ground the ground around them as they're as they're marching across the field they're obviously not running until the final assault right um they have to they have to march it at a, at a you know marching pace so you know and then once they get close then you get the the devastating effect of rifle fire yeah that's true and you know by the time by the time they reach union lines before they even close with union lines they more or less taken you know red, red hawk said earlier that they that the whole charge took about 60% casualties. By the time they'd reached the lines, they had already taken about 40. And in the U.S. Army, you're taught that if you take 33% casualties, your unit is rendered about combat ineffective because you just you simply cannot perform the tasks of warfare. But you know, General George Pickett, famously, all of his all of his um, um his brigade commanders were felled one by one. Uh, um, you know, the, the first one on under, uh, under under Pickett's brigade was um, um that was felled was Richard Garnett. Now Richard Garnett was uh, was in command of the Stonewall Brigade after Stonewall Jackson was promoted to uh, to division command, and um, uh, Garnett got very infamously in a disagreement with Stonewall at the Battle of Winchester. He made a tactical decision, much like Lee could have, to pull out the Stonewall Brigade at the it was the it was either the first it was it was the first Battle of Winchester. Um, because he had false intelligence and he had actually encountered a union force about three times as strong as his. And, um, and Garnett, you know, Garnett gotten Stonewall basically relieved him from command, called him a coward and had him court-martialed. Um, however, Stonewall died before they could see that through. And, um, he was very unceremoniously put back in command because the Confederacy was hurting for generals. Um, and so Garnett was a, was a, Brigade commander under Pickett, wounded, very eager to redeem himself. Um, famously charged into the battle on horseback, and uh, and no one could really find him because he was a big target, and it's very likely he was killed during the charge. The second one was um, a Brigadier General James Lawson Kemper, who is my ancestor, who is a lawyer in the um, a lawyer in the Piedmont prior to the war, Speaker of the Virginia House, and um, would later become Governor of Virginia after the war. But he was wounded during the charge. 
and um uh, and recovered and then um most famously of the three of them was uh brigadier general lewis armistead who um was kicked out of west point before the war for uh, breaking a plate over his fellow general jubal early's head mostly because jubal early was the son of a bitch and everyone kind of hated him uh, but then again he was a prosecuting attorney so you could see why everyone hated him um but armistead was best friends with um the with hancock corps com- yeah the corps commander he was charging winfield scott hancock prior to the war mm-hmm. and he was he very famously sticks his sticks his uh sticks a sword through his hat and rallies the only really coherent attack on the union lines manages to break through the initial line get to what's called the cops of trees and um but then he was the the attack was stemmed by reinforcing units and it was broken and um general armistead was wounded and then later died of that and this this is you can visit this point at the battlefield of gettysburg is called the high water mark of the confederacy um you know basically another famous story old old miss in oxford mississippi is their mascot is called the rebels. Why did they specifically choose the rebels as their mascot when there's all these su- other Southern colleges who had men fight who could have chosen it? And that's because the 100% of the university of Mississippi class of 1860, um, or no, it was the class of 1861 resigned. They had to cancel classes because they had no student body resigned and enlisted. They were called the university grays. And, um, they were they somehow were attached to um, I believe they were attached to Pickett's division, uh, but they were all from Mississippi and they took 100 percent casualties, one charge, and they were all either killed or wounded. And that's why Ole Miss has had I don't know they still have the Rebels as their uh, as their mascot because their college took 100 percent casualties of the class of 1861. So with the defeat of Pickett's charge. Um, that basically concludes the, the main action of the battle. Um, and the real, the real decision on the union side, the real thing that Lee gets kind of torn up about, um, by the Washington types after the battle is, okay, so you received the charge of the Confederates. Why didn't you, you know, counterattack and, and crush Lee's army? And the answer strategically and tactically is, why you've already inflicted uh, this roughly the same amount of casualties that you've dealt out which is you know a tactical loss for the confederate forces you've already ensured that the the confederates are not going to get their strategic goals met for this campaign so you make you basically have achieved a strategic victory so why why would you snatch defeat out of the jaws of (laughs) out of the jaws of victory right um so this is a sound decision, and of course Meade's forces are also, you know, fairly you know damaged at this point as well. So why would you attack in in response when the Confederates can retreat up to Seminary Ridge where they all came from and uh, you know defend that position against the Union forces? So it, it's it's a better decision for me to stay put where he is in this battle um, and not counterattack. Yeah, it's true. Um, and, um, you know, Lee, Lee, this is kind of like after the end of Pickett's charge, Lee kind of sort of snaps out of it, as it were. Um, no one really knows what was going on with him at Gettysburg, but he very competently, very competently organizes his army, um, very rapidly starts a retreat back down south through the valley the way he came into Virginia with defensible terrain. And um, he was afraid that Meade was going to immediately pursue him, but Meade Meade was very slow off the draw, and he was and Lincoln Lincoln was very pissed at Meade. Lincoln, you know, you know Lincoln very much like you know he did not congratulate Meade initially. He actually he kind of sent like why didn't you pursue him? And Meade was basically like I just won the first major battle this army has won since um, Malvern Hill. Why are you? W- do you want me to resign? Cause I will resign right now. And Lincoln kind of, you know, backed up a little bit. Cause it's not a, it is, it is an unbelievable. Cause there were all sorts of rumblings 
in the North about Lincoln meddling in the war too much. And if Lincoln fired a commander who won a battle, it, you know, with election season coming up that next year, it was, it was going to look very bad on him. Um, but Meade eventually gears up his army to pursue. And, and by that point, um, by that point, Lee had already gotten most of his army across the river. Um, yes. And, and may I add to the point about Lee's retreat, um, Lee and especially uh, Longstreet underneath him, no matter what happened, they always ensured the discipline and the good order of their troops. Um, every, that goes until the very end of the war. Uh, it, they, their ability to reform, to reorganize and to maneuver their forces uh, and and not turn a defeat, uh, not allowing a defeat to turn into a rout is why Lee is able to escape vastly superior Union forces time and time again. Yeah, and I mean, this is this is very much remembered as the the most decisive battle of the war. It could have gone either way in a variety of instances, but. You know, no one understands why Lee ordered Pickett's charge to this day. It was the greatest single mistake committed by any general on either side of the war. And um, and um, and after after the battle, once he arrived back in Virginia, he submitted a letter to Jefferson Davis offering his resignation, which uh, Jefferson Davis rejected and basically said, you know, you we cannot really replace you. You know, you are you are the only real general here that is irreplaceable. And um, so Lee licked his wounds and started recuperating his army. And um, the you could very much say that actually the first half of the Civil War, this sort of very romantic Napoleonic um, circumstance and flash part of the war ended when the Battle of Gettysburg ended. And after the Battle of Gettysburg, it turned into something more resembling World War I than the, um, uh, than the fields of Waterloo. A slog. That's what it turned into. Indeed. So we're looking here in the actual aftermath of the battle, the bloodiest day of, you know, American military history. Bloodiest um, three days. Bloodiest yeah. three days, yeah. Yeah, indeed. With um, 51,000 uh, casualties, uh, both sides suffering extreme losses, 28,000 Confederate casualties to 23,000 Union casualties. Um, just absolute, you know, bloodshed of a, a yeah. absurd level. So just to to, um, to quote the loss rate here, so Lee's army um, lost about thirty, about a third in casualties, right? Whereas the Union forces lost about a quarter. So if you're in the position of Lee, losing in terms of not just total numbers but also in terms of percentage, much more than your enemy is is not good. So yeah, and. Um... Lee still had a coherent army afterward. Um, he, you know, the Confederate army was always kind of fighting from behind and he eventually replenished some of his numbers, but it was, it was really, it was the defeat at Gettysburg. And then the day immediately after on July the 4th, Vicksburg surrendered. And that was a sort of double barreled blow to the Confederacy that they never really recovered from. It was, you know, at that point, even though there were, there were minor chances where something could have been achieved at that point, it was more or less a, a matter of when the Confederacy was defeated and not if. Yeah, of course. And then the final bit of uh, aftermath of this is that um, President Lincoln would go on to give his famous uh, Gettysburg Address several months later uh, in November at the location of the battle here. So uh, any other final closing thoughts here, gentlemen, on the Battle of Gettysburg itself? No, sir. I mean, really only this. Um, no one knows what Lee was thinking, why he was thinking it, what led him to make the decisions he made, because it really was his battle to lose, you know? And, um, I think the only way people can understand it and people can really characterize it is when, you know, when Shelby Foote was writing his three volume history of the civil war and he got to the Gettysburg section, he titled it stars in their courses, which is the most famous section of the three volume work. And someone asked him, Someone asked him, why did you title it Stars in Their Courses? And he said, because stars in their courses conspired to defeat Lee at Gettysburg. Yeah, excellent words uh, to end on there. 
uh, gentlemen. Well, this has been a fantastic stream. I think we've done a fantastic job of uh, explaining and the battle in great detail. And hopefully everyone in the audience has learned something and continues to join us on our coverage here on the Old Glory Club of Gettysburg Day. Uh, stay tuned because we are about to uh, move right into discussing the famous uh, Gettysburg movie. Um, so please stick around for that one. I'm sure plenty of people in the audience have seen it. Um, so stick around for that one. Any other closing thoughts, gents? Nothing. Nope. All right. Excellent. Thank you for joining us on Gettysburg Day and stay tuned. We'll be right back.